Hey friends, welcome to another Before You Read lecture for reading the Bible together. This lecture is on the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation. So it's the first of two lectures on the book of Revelation. In this uh, Before You Read lecture, I want to provide a sort of basic introduction, very basic introduction to Revelation. In particular, Revelation's uh, fit within what we would call apocalyptic literature more generally. Then I want to explore three modes of reading Revelation, provide a brief outline of this section of Revelation, and then offer a few guiding questions as you engage this material on your own. Let me begin with a, a little bit about Revelation and apocalyptic. Now, most scholars, most scholarly interpretations of Revelation are going to make this connection between the book of Revelation and apocalyptic. So what you might ask is apocalyptic. Apocalyptic comes from the Greek word akapalupsis, uh, uh, apocalypsis, which simply means to unveil or to reveal. It is uh, a, a genre of literature, uh, a, a category of literature from the ancient world that, that scholars have identified. We see traces of this in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, including in Daniel 7 through 12, Isaiah 55 through 65, uh, parts of Ezekiel. But then there outside of the New Testament or outside of the Bible, there are several other examples that precede the New Testament and some that follow the New Testament. It is revelatory literature. It provides access to hidden or otherwise unaccessible uh, realities. It is, I think, also rightly described as crisis literature. It is the literature of a people pressed to the extreme who are trying to make sense of God's goodness and God's justice in a world and an experience that seems entirely devoid of that. So in many ways, uh, apocalyptic literature generally sort of looks to the divine perspective to help people who are suffering and experiencing crisis in, the con in their everyday lives. Uh, it helps them sort it out and have some sort of theological bearing and direction as they move forward. Carl Holliday points out in his introduction to the New Testament, there is a typical structure to apocalyptic literature. This includes the use of a first-person narrative, so it's a story told from the first-person perspective. It often includes either a revelatory vision uh, or a tour of extra uh, ordinary realities, either heaven or hell in some cases. Frequently, there is an angelic interpreter, uh, uh, an angelic being that travels with the, the main character and offers interpretation and often serves as a sort of uh, sounding board for asking questions. And then, of course, uh, there is the, 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 the act of revealing, the, the, the content uh, of the revelation, uh, whether it's a sort of a review of history leading up to a certain point or a tour of extra-worldly realities, uh, heavenly throne rooms, or, or the, the prisons in, in shale for uh, rebellious angels. These are all parts of what we see in other apocalyptic texts. So Revelation itself uh, shares many of these common features, as you will see in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it opens with a heavenly vision. It identifies a first-person narrative seer named John, who has been exiled to Patmos. And it contains a number of, uh, of powerful visions and, a, and an angelic interpreter and, and certainly a, a divine perspective on what is going on in, on the ground. Revelation, uh, and apocalyptic more generally, uses deeply symbolic, even veiled language to communicate its points. And so we need to be aware of these different modes of reading Revelation. I think that the, probably the most common mode of reading Revelation is the predictive mode. This looks at Revelation as little more than a, a, a timetable for the end of the world. And all that we need is the, the person who can decode it for us. And if we decode it properly, we will understand that final timeline for the end of the world. 
Now, the major weakness in this approach is that it's old and that we've been doing this for hundreds of years and we haven't gotten it right. And so it sort of reduces revelation to say, eh, you know, it's just a timetable. If we can just sort of determine and discern its deep puzzles and its mysterious language, then we figured it out. And if we can't, then it's actually a very little resource. And so I want to open up a way of reading that is a bit more uh, productive uh, than simply a predictive mode of reading. A second mode of reading that's very important, but also limited to some degree, is what I would call a historical mode of reading. This is an approach to Revelation that tries to understand it within its original historical context, somewhere late in the first century, uh, addressed to Christians living in Asia Minor who are experiencing tremendous turmoil and hardship because of their commitment to the early Christian movement and because of their non-participation in the religious rituals and ceremonies of their of their uh, other of their neighbors, uh, specifically veneration of the Roman emperor. And so this historical mode is going to look for details and clues in the text of Revelation that speak to that specific context, to that specific experience of persecution. Now, I think this is a deeply helpful way of reading Revelation. It opens it up in, I think, important ways, but it can have the tendency of limiting uh, the importance of Revelation to that historical moment in the late first century. And so we need to find a way to open it up in new and fresh ways. And that then gets us to what I would call the analogical mode of reading Revelation. It builds on the historical mode. It, 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 it rests in that, uh, the, those, those historical details and clues from the text, but it ultimately is trying to make a connection for how does Revelation help us understand our world, understand our issues, understand our struggles for power and for crisis and all of that in, in a particular way. So we're drawing comparisons, we're drawing analogies, we're using Revelation as a framework for understanding ourselves, our world, our communities, and uh, everything else in between. Let me briefly provide an outline for this material in Revelation. Again, for the first week, just read Revelation 1 through 11. And what you'll see is that chapter 1 opens by identifying the author and with this really powerful vision of the risen Christ. Uh, it's detailed, it's powerful, it's awesome. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we have the seven letters to the churches, the seven what I call prophetic proclamations to the churches. Then in chapters 4 and 5, we have this amazingly beautiful picture of heavenly worship where both God and Jesus receive veneration. And then in chapters 6 through 10, we have uh, the beginning of these cycles of seven. So you'll have seven seals and you'll have seven trumpets. And there's this progression of, of really powerful, somewhat unnerving or disturbing imagery and visions. Um, and the important thing I think to note about this is that these cycles of seven, I think are best understood as a cyclic, um, in a cyclic mode rather than a linear mode. That is to say, it's not seven things happen and then these seven things happen and then these seven things happen. Rather, it, it's a sort of a, ref, a reflection on the same basic events, but just from a slightly different perspective. And we're going to see in Revelation 6 through 16, three of these cycles of seven. And you'll be able to see some of these similarities and how it's essentially the same events being looked at from a slightly different angle. Finally, in chapters 10 and 11, there is what New Testament interpreters call an interlude, a break uh, from the, the seven uh, cycle, the, the, the cycle of seven. And uh, there's some important information in there about John the Seer, uh, also about these two witnesses in chapter 11, which I understand to be uh, sort of a, sim a symbol of the community addressed by Revelation. Let me conclude with just a few questions to guide your reading of Revelation 1 through 11. The first is, what is the effect of the visual and sensory nature of Revelation 1 through 11, or particular visions in this material? 
How does Revelation appeal to the senses? How does it even create a sort of literary experience for those who are reading or hearing it? The second is pay attention to similarities and differences among the letters in Revelation 2 through 3. What stands out to you about the issues that are addressed in these chapters? Similarly, pay attention to the first two cycles of seven and what are their similarities and what are the differences that you see in these cycles. And finally, I invite you to consider what is the overall function of the interlude in chapters 10 and 11? What does it do for the reader or the hearer to sort of have a pause and consider these two chapters? Well, that is my Before You Read lecture for Revelation 1 through 11. I hope that it will give us more than enough material to discuss and that it will help you engage Revelation 1 through 11 in a, in a, in a helpful and generative way. Thank you so much and happy reading.